Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today is Micah chapter 2, read just a few moments ago. In our text for today, Micah has accusations. He has law, if you will, for two different groups of people. First and most certainly primary in chapter 2 are the wealthy of his day. And second are the false prophets, but he'll have more to say to them in future weeks. In chapter 2, most of Micah's accusations go towards the wealthy people around him. But interestingly, and maybe counterintuitively, maybe not, Micah does not accuse the people around them because they are wealthy. No, in fact, Micah recognizes, and again, we'll see more of this going forward. Micah recognizes that the reason these individuals are wealthy is because God has given them many things. They have been given blessings from God. No, it is not the fact that there are wealthy that Micah is upset about, if you will. Rather, Micah accuses these individuals because of how they are behaving, particularly with their wealth. You see, they are supposed to use these many blessings from God to be blessings to the people around them. Those who have, at least in God's kingdom, are supposed to help those who are are in need. This, by the way, will be the focus of next week's sermon in chapter 3. In this chapter, however, the sins that Micah accuses really both the wealthy and the false prophets of can be condensed down to one word. Coveting. You know, it's not something we talk about much. I don't think it's something we think terribly much about either. In fact, I'm not sure if I've ever in my years here preached a single sermon on coveting. And there's a chance that I was assigned Commandments 9 and 10 back when we went through the catechism about six years ago. That's probably about it. We don't talk about coveting much. We don't think about coveting much. Yet, it is the central focus of chapter 2 here. You see, the wealthy of Micah's day have much. We know through context of the other books of the Bible that the wealthy are very wealthy. Those who have, have most of what there is. Yet, they desire more. To the point where their lives are consumed with getting more. With having more. The chapter opens, Woe to those who devise evil in their beds. The wealthy spend all their time They lie awake at night, concocting new schemes to get, to have. And as soon as they wake up, they put their plans into action. Their lives are consumed with getting more. And perhaps what's worst of all, they really do not care who they have to hurt to get more. Men, women, children, the poor, even babies are referenced. No one is beyond their covetous desires. I think one of the things about coveting we don't think about very often is how much 
coveting can impact our lives. You see, the more and more I've thought about this as I've prepared for this sermon, the more and more I've come to think that coveting is a much more prominent sin than we tend to think. I think it's also much more significant than we give it credit for. I think coveting is far more pervasive in our lives than we often tend to think. And I think it impacts us more than we believe. Coveting, unlike other sins, or at least in a different way than other sins, isolates us pushes the people, pushes everything away from us, leaving us in our own shell. It's easy to see how those who were coveting in Micah's day were isolated from those around them. Rather than seeing their possessions as blessings to help the people near them, they spend their time discontent. Always trying and striving to get even just a little more, even if it's only from those who have so little. Coveting isolates us from one another, but it also isolates us from God in a way that other sins don't. You see, we are, when we are discontent with what God has given us, when we always want just a little more, when we think this one last thing is finally what we need to be happy and content in our lives, well, the more and more we forget who it is who provides for us, who provides for all of our needs, big and small. Rather than trusting in God, saying, give us this day our daily bread, we begin to trust in our own greed, our own desire, our own ability to obtain ever more. Perhaps saying, give me this day all the bread I will ever need for all my life. Coveting separates us from one another. Coveting separates us from God. And what might be even worse is that not only does covetous desire isolate us from God and one another, it also forces us to think of each other as nothing more than a means to an end. What can this person give me? Or maybe even worse, what can I get from this person. It also makes us look to God in the same way. I look to God to satisfy the desires of my heart. In this way, covenant can turn God into little more than a genie in a bottle, a means to an end. Yet, even in the midst of our condemnation, even in the midst of our covetousness, Micah gives us, in this chapter, our first taste of gospel in the book. He looks forward to the Messiah, describing Him in two ways. The Messiah as shepherd. The Messiah as conqueror. We, with the benefit of hindsight, know exactly who it is that Micah speaks of. Micah looks forward and sees none other than Christ, gathering his people together and winning victory for them. The end of this chapter has put an image in my mind. It's a picture that I can't get rid of, nor do I want to. It's a beautiful gospel picture. I hope you'll be able to see it with me. You're in a dark room. Black all around. Maybe there's a small sliver of light. 
And through it, you can tell that you are not in a room at all, but a tomb. And you are not alone. For early this first Easter Sunday morning, Christ is in this tomb with you. As he walks towards that stone, smiling for a moment before kicking it away. Bursting forth from the tomb, ta- pausing for just a moment to beckon you to come and follow him. As our conqueror and shepherd defeats his enemies, gathering us, gathering all of us to be with him, pictured as a noisy multitude of sheep following on this victorious victory parade out of the tomb. It's a beautiful picture. There's a shocking detail to it as well. You see, we might expect that the gospel, the one who will deliver the people in Micah, we might expect him to only deliver the poor. Those who have been downtrodden and oppressed by the rich, Yet that's not the picture Micah paints. No, this conqueror and shepherd, Messiah, Jesus Christ Himself, is for all of Israel. For all people, rich and poor alike, sinners and saints, though sinners we all are. The Gospel of Micah is that Christ is the conquering shepherd. For all people. Now those of you who have been listening carefully might have a question in your mind right about now. If you do, it might be the same question that I asked myself countless times as I was preparing for this sermon. I even asked my shut-ins if they could help me, the ones that I visited this week. What is Easter? What does Christ as our shepherd and champion, wonderful pictures though they are, what does any of this have to do with coveting? How in the world does Jesus rising from the dead solve the problem of my covetous sin? How does it solve the problem of the wealthy covetous elite in Micah's day? The answer may be surprising, but it lies right in front of us. Even though, at least for me, it was almost impossible to see. The gospel, that Jesus has risen from the dead, defeated all of our enemies. Yes, sin, death, and the power of the devil is the only solution is the only solution to our sin of coveting. It's the only solution to any of our sins. What may seem like a mixing of metaphors or perhaps two isolated sermons is exactly the absurdity of the cross, at least human reason, that Paul speaks of. How does God solve the problem of a covetous, wealthy, and abusing a class that abuses the poor? He dies on the cross. He rises from the dead. How does God solve the problem of my isolating covenant? He dies on the cross. And he rises from the dead. Jesus breaks through the breach, not only of the tomb, not only of death and the grave, but also the wall of sin in our lives. The wall of sin that has separated us from God. The sin of covenant and indeed all sinfulness in our lives. Christ, by dying on the cross and rising from the dead, breaks through it all. He shepherds us out of our sin, sick, and dying world into eternal life. 
It's a strange solution. It doesn't always seem to make sense. And yet, it is God's one and only solution. In Jesus' name, amen.